so now we're on to our um, our next panel discussion, which is uh, one that it's kind of drawing the connection between um, our ambitions as a city. Uh, one where we're obviously talking about this music tech cluster that we have in the K Road precinct, and we've talked a lot about drawing the connections between the nighttime economy as well, and a lot of the people who work in these. Uh, uh, successful companies like Serato and then music and melodics during the day are actually um, artists and DJs and performers and musicians in their own right. And so that nighttime economy is a really important piece of having a healthy and vibrant ecosystem. So we've spent a lot of time talking about uh, the music tech side so far, but now we just wanted to draw it back a little to the nighttime economy. And um, our panel here this afternoon is a group of people who have a whole lot to say about that, and we're going to have a bit of a, a chat about that now. So I'm uh, going to start from left to right. So we've got Taylor McGregor, who is with uh, representing Save Our Venues today. We'll talk about Save Our Venues in a second. Uh, Rob Warner. Um, many people will know Rob. He has been a stalwart of the uh, DJ scene here in New Zealand for... Uh, far far too long, far many more years than I'm probably going to say on stage. But uh, and he's been a tireless advocate for uh, the nighttime economy over the years as well, and has done a lot of lobbying of government in terms of uh, advocacy, advocacy and, and helping kind of um, get the point of view of the nighttime economy out there with uh, policymakers. And then, uh, lucky last, we got Mark Roach, and Mark is uh, wearing his official hat today as our rep for the uh, Auckland City of Music. Um, and you will see some badges around uh, the place as well, which we're going to give everyone too. So uh, just as a reminder. So what we'll do first is I'll probably start with Mark and just get him to talk a little bit about his background, his role, and actually uh, tell everyone about Auckland City as the as a UNESCO city of music and what that actually means. A lot of people actually aren't even aware that we are a UNESCO city of music. So take it away, Mark. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Joanna. Um, kia ora, everyone. Uh, ko Mark Roach, toko uh, So I wear several hats, including the one I've got on today. Um, but I'm here as director of Auckland City of Music. Um, I also a uh, special project manager at Recorded Music New Zealand, and I run my own creative agency called Muse, um, which does design, marketing, and so forth for music industry clients as well as artist management. Um, so the city of music is uh, it's a strange beast. It's um, it's not an entity. Um, it's it's uh, some, in some ways a badge. It's a conglomeration of various interested parties. Um, but I mean, crucially, it is a mechanism, and that mechanism is to allow the music sector and the music community to. Uh, affect change and start dialogue with the city and get policies moving uh, on a municipal level. Um, so in this very basic form, that's what it is there to serve. Um, it undergoes uh, a huge amount of um, projects and uh, we go into bat and we do advocacy on behalf of various music community factions. Um, but to take it back a little bit, I guess the UNESCO um, Designation. So that, that was something that came up five years ago. Uh, I approached council at the time, said this is a really good idea, we should do this. Um, they agreed and, and we applied to UNESCO to be part of the UNESCO Creative Cities uh, network. So, and to address the point Jonah makes about uh, <laughs> flying under the radar somewhat, it's not helped by the fact that UNESCO itself doesn't promote the Creative Cities network very well globally. Um, we have a national commission here, um, as as most uh, any any member state joining the um, as part of UNESCO has a has a national commission, um, but it's not their job to promote the Creative City Net Cities Network. They 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 promote the work of UNESCO generally. Um, the Secretariat, which exists in Paris, uh, has a very limited budget, so they they don't promote it globally. Um, so it's kind of left to the cities to do to do their own thing, which makes makes things tricky. I will say, however, though, that the UNESCO component of this isn't the most crucial part. So for me, it was always about the fact that the UNESCO badge, if you like, creates a uh, it's an insurance policy against apathy. So there are plenty of cities around the world so uh, that are famous for being music cities, um, say Nashville or Austin, Seattle, perhaps, um, and uh, they have music city policies, but they're not UNESCO cities. They're, they haven't joined this UNESCO Creative Cities Network. Um, 
So it's entirely possible that you can have music city policies and music friendly policies on a municipal level without without having to go through the rigmarole of joining joining the UNESCO network. Um, however, for me, I was it was always about uh, getting things done at a, at a municipal level um, and getting the air of councillors and staff is a lot easier when the UNESCO badge is attached to it. Um, it just makes it, it gives it a little bit more prestige, gets a few more doors opened. And having to report back to UNESCO on that international level kind of helps the city keep its socks up. So, yeah. Awesome. And, uh, and Rob, you've come less from that sort of background and more from the actual nightlife background yourself as a DJ and then have got into advocacy from there. So do you want to just touch on that background? Yeah, um, I, I um, you know, rolling back to your comment about my time in the industry, I, I surprised myself this year to realise that I've been DJing for 30 years. <laughs> so very long time. But um, um, I've always um, DJed and been involved in promoting for many, many, many years through the 90s and early 2000s. And um, I... I realised in about 2012-13 that incoming alcohol law changes were going to have a disproportionately harsh effect on music venues and um, through speaking to APRA and the New Zealand Music Commission I realised that unless individuals in the music scene went and did something and sort of got involved um, at sort of protecting the community or just advocating with the council and then with the government eventually, that nothing would happen. So I, um, I got involved and started doing it, thinking it would be writing a few letters, and it ended up being many, many years of involvement in, in court cases, and um, um, you know, it just rolled over further and further and further. And um, where we're at with that is um, Auckland still has 4 a.m. closing. Um, the next government will probably take another run at alcohol laws, so, um, you know, ideally they want venues to be shutting at 2 a.m. or 1 a.m. And um, I am constantly mindful of that and how we can get younger people on the scene who have got more years left in their career or, or their involvement um, than me to recognise that and group together with organisations like APRA and um, initiatives like Auckland City of Music and the Council and show a more of a united front um, aside from that, um, that flowed on in the pandemic as well and um, Jonah, you and I have spoken about this a lot about how venues and artists were um, uh, extra punished by lockdowns. Lockdowns were longer for artists than the venues like Nick of the Woods and Ink Bar and Ponsonby Social Club and any, anyone doing festivals. So um, I got involved with the Ministry of Culture and Heritage um, first on um, forming uh, a fund that would help protect festivals and then later on um, one which would be artist grants, the $5,000 grants. So um, that's sort of my involvement in the scene these days when I'm not DJing um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Awesome. Cheers. And uh, lucky last we have a young energetic um, up-and-comer who's ready to Take the mantle from Rob when he retires. <laughs> Taylor McGregor, tell us about your background. I think I've never been called energetic before, but <laughs> thank you. Uh, kia ora, I'm Taylor. Um, up until recently, I was uh, booking and venue managing backroom at Whammy, uh, and I've been a promoter for a long time um, and very involved in kind of the venue space, and then have recently come on board with um, Save Our Venues, which is uh, an organisation that was set up uh, during... COVID or well, lockdowns uh, to raise money, specifically to raise money for venues to survive them and now has kind of turned into a um, long-term advocacy body um, to work f with venues and for venues to um, create a more sustainable future for them. I think COVID uh, really revealed a lot of the problems that already existed there and exacerbated them um, and now we're kind of working to develop, develop a world in which venues can survive something like this happening and, and actually invest in making them better spaces and um, a lot of that is, I mean we talk about nighttime economy and, and things like that later on but um, they are the hubs for our community and they are the spaces where artists come through and are so much bigger than just uh, a business that puts on shows and they're, they're kind of crucial to 
the whole creative economy in New Zealand and um, they should be respected as kind of cultural institutions as such and um, we have uh, got everyone together in the same room uh, a few weeks ago and uh, had a venue summit at Whammy and people are venue owners are talking to each other and uh, kind of on a united front to to work out how we make this better for for them as venue operators and all the people that come through them um, so yeah that's what we're up to yeah awesome and I think um it's hard to get away from the backdrop of the pandemic over the last couple of years for <clears throat> for the music industry. But um, and we obviously we all know about the challenges. But I think there have been silver linings that have come out of this kind of last two years. And I think Save Our Venues is a really good example of that, where we've kind of joined the dots and connected more as uh, as a group of venue owners coming together as an industry with a, a much more united voice. And I think even this two-day event is another example. You know, we've had the support of um, Auckland Unlimited with some funding to help us put this event on. Uh, and part of the reason that that funding was available was it was about encouraging people to get back into the city and participate in events and do things. But it's given us a platform now to come together and start talking about some of these connections and these opportunities and these challenges which we need to kind of really be thinking about because we've got this opportunity to reset Auckland and New Zealand more broadly uh, as we kind of emerge out of the pandemic and I think government <coughs> and everybody else in e economic development they we're always talking about the knowledge based economy and we want uh, high value tech exports and, and people with global markets and we've we've got a great example of that with the music tech cluster that is around Serato and Melodics and in music here but we really need to think about what are the factors that are going to actually support and make them be successful as we go forward. And what does that mean? You know, we have a, a creative uh, economy and a, and a city that we want to be creative and innovative. And there's a big piece of that that requires to have us to have some great cultural infrastructure around us as well. And the music ecosystem is one of those most important pieces. It's also one of the most fragile at the moment as we kind of come out of the recovery battered and bruised. And I think this is the opportunity for us all to, to start thinking about what is that landscape as we go forward. And to some of the comments from Mark and Rob, is that how, how do we do that in a united voice? And how do we do it in a way which makes sure we think about all those connections between both daytime and nighttime? And I think the CEO panel, which is coming next, will talk a lot about building a tech startup in the, in the music space, you know, from the perspective of being a CEO of Serato or Melodics or in music. but what we should talk about here is like what are the things that we need to do to underpin that music infrastructure so we have this healthy nighttime ecosystem. And I guess that's the next question then for Mark. <clears throat> it's kind of under this city of music designation, what are the opportunities and the challenges that you see coming out of the pandemic now and where do you see us potentially being able to focus and what are the things you're interested in seeing us pull together as an industry? So yeah, that um, idea of the silver lining is is, is very prevalent, and, and um, Taylor and I have talked about this as well. Which is the um, Save Our Venues is a, is a classic example of, of of that. So prior to the lockdown, um, it was very difficult for me, particularly to uh, say represent venues or to talk about venues to council because there wasn't a common voice there. There wasn't a a collective voice, um, and the current Music and Venues Fund, which is um, closes on Friday, if, if anyone still wants to get an application in, you can. Um, that came about um, because of the connection we already have with council, so I could introduce uh, council to save our venues, we could have that conversation and find a, an efficiency there, I guess, a, a way that uh, council could invest in, in venues in a, in a practical sense and find those solutions. And that didn't exist two years ago. Um, so uh, us having a seat at the table, I think, has is, is, is been really positive um, and, a, and a way that we can keep developing these ideas. Um, I will say as well that the, both the council's current um, uh, short-term, sort of next 12 months at least, is very focused on music, um, and that's going through the PACE committee at the moment. Uh, and the Auckland Unlimited is likewise um, recognising the value of music uh, as a positive way forward to build the rebuild the Auckland economy alongside um, the gaming and um, screen sectors as well. Um, and 
so amongst that, we, we these questions come up, um, and particularly around economies, and it's, and it's it's a difficult conversation to have around the music space because there is the cultural economy, there is the, the economy that we can't measure, and we we constantly talk about how how do you value cultural assets, um, and t- t- Taylor's point as well that um, we need to move away from this idea that music venues are purely about uh, making money off um, whether it be off off gigs off off bars bar takes whatever um, that they are community hubs they're, they're places where the uh, music communities come together and we've got to start um, valuing them as such and getting through it so that's a challenge because that that requires a huge shift in the way that councils operate that, that licensing operates the way that that um, local government and central governments think about uh, music spaces and about hospitality. Um, so, yeah, there's the challenges ahead of us are, are immense, but I will come back to the fact that we have got the air of various agencies that can make these changes. Um, it's not going to happen overnight, but it's 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 something I feel positive about now after after sort of having to do this advocacy for the last sort of five, five years or so under the City of Music banner and a lot longer than that, um, under the national recorded music banner, um, it feels like this is the right time to make these calls. That that if we're going to reset, if we're going to demand changes, um, now is now is a great time to do it. Yeah. And, and what about for you, Rob? What, what are you seeing as the opportunities and challenges for us? Um, I, I just the silver linings thing comes up for me. Um, I, I've been really impressed that during the pandemic new zealand you know for how difficult it was we had it pretty easy compared to a lot of the world but one of the challenges here was we were unable to bring in international artists so i found that events and festivals seem to have fantastic local lineups and it gave a rare opportunity for local artists to be elevated further up the chain and hierarchy of artists and the events over the two-year period are arguably better in a lot of ways. And I think New Zealand um, should, you know, take note of that and see that it's something to be proud about, that you don't always have to hire high-priced international artists for events, that we have a lot of fantastic talent here and it would be really cool if, um, in in part with venues as well and with um, council or government support, that um, that um, that kind of trend continued. And I don't know whether it has to be driven by promoters or venues, but um, I, I like the idea that lots of people who previously were second-tier artists on, on, a, on a big festival are now the headliners. And that's, that's a pretty cool thing that we should be proud about. And you know, if, if there was any positive to come from the pandemic for music artists, I think that the local creative sector, that, that was one of the things. So something to protect and not lose as we as we have the borders reopen. Right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, and then for Taylor, um, because in your role with Save Our Venues, you've come in specifically, obviously wearing that venue focused hat. But where what's happening for you and Save Our Venues? Obviously, we've talked a lot, but um, I think people would be interested to hear what what's coming down the track in terms of your priorities and where you see wearing the Save Our Venues kind of banner. Um, we've got some opportunities here. Yeah. Well, I think this is, uh, it's kind of given us a seat at the table now. And I think the indus- music industry is really recognizing that everything actually starts in venues. Like we talk about building up New Zealand artists, like that's been happening over the last little while. They, they're they important to licensing bodies, they're impor- important to promoters. Everyone is on board with it now. And we've got everyone in the room and can kind of work to uplift the local community that are, that are playing in small and medium venues here and that, that means getting better representation in there making them safe spaces making them less reliant on alcohol uh, it's having everyone is very enthusiastic about using this opportunity to make venues better and as 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 something that assists all of the other elements in the in the industry and there's a um yeah can have an understanding from venues that they have a bigger role to play than just whether they sell enough piss on the night, basically. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I can definitely um, <coughs> agree with that. I mean, as, as a venue owner, I think I am much more aware post-pandemic of the role that we can play in kind of supporting the ecosystem and, and the need for us to kind of get more directly involved, I think. Um, 
So that's that's definitely been something I've I've personally noticed myself, and I think I've seen that in the other venue owners that I've engaged with through Save Our Venues. So yep, hundred percent agree with that. So I think then if we're all talking about we've, we we're getting better platforms as an industry, I think is one of the themes that's come out of here. Whether that's Save Our Venues or these kind of opportunities to have a collective voice at events like this. So we, we've got this opportunity to start building a better platform. But what are some of the best practices that we're seeing that maybe we could, uh, and, and you usually offshore probably, I mean, places like Europe obviously got a lot of interesting things happening. You know, what, what are some of the best practices that we should be thinking about bringing into New Zealand, bringing into Auckland, you know, advocating for as a group? I mean, I know Mark, Mark and Rob in particular, I know you've all researched a lot about what's happening offshore and have, have thoughts on that. So probably, Mark, what, what are you seeing that we could think about bringing into New Zealand here? Um, well, I think Rob will probably agree with me on this one, but um, a nighttime economy manager, or um, is there um, frequently <laughs> called overseas the nightmare, which is just a dreadful, <laughs> dreadful name. Um, so we're kind of, uh, I'm plumping for a nighttime economy manager. It's not doesn't sound quite as night as czar is pretty cool. Night czar, night yeah, czar. yeah. The, so so around globally, um, they they operate under different names. Um, the original. Um, Nightmare, uh, and, and that name came about because it sounded a lot better in the original Dutch. Yeah, Merrick Milan. That was Amsterdam. Yeah, Merrick Milan. Yeah, yeah, yeah Merrick Milan. So he was the, he was the first uh, nighttime mayor, and um, yeah. Uh, and so it, d it does operate um, under different names and different guises in different cities, but the the constant is that there is someone dedicated to the nighttime economy and uh, treating the nighttime economy with as much seriousness and respect as the daytime economy. Um, the classic example is in London, where, uh, so London was thinking about um, putting the tube on 24-7, um, uh, just two, two of the lines, two of the major lines they wanted to put on um, to, ru to run 24 hours a day. So to do that, they under underwent a, an examination of their nighttime economy and found it was generating something like 40 billion pounds in GDP or something, some insane amount of money. Um, and it was like a light bulb moment for London, so they just went, holy shit, it's like we had no idea that we were generating this amount of, because no one had ever looked at it, because it, that the, those old tropes were, were circulating all the time, that the night time is, is nothing but bad news stories. It's all alcohol harm, it's all violence, it's um, nothing good can ever come out of the nighttime economy. Um, once that narrative switch around to it generates a lot of GDP, it generates jobs, it generates wealth for the city, then then the conversation shifted. Um. Yeah, and, and to, to add to that, when you look at cities like everyone knows about Berlin and New York probably in the, in the 80s and 90s, that when you have a really good um, creative sector at night time, whether it's just music or it's visual art as well, it becomes a much more attractive place for people to move to, especially young people who are um, on gap years or um, or coming to study. And not having it is a deal breaker for pretty much anyone under 30 um, as far as I've looked around the world. Like people don't move to LA um, to, to get involved in the music scene. They still move to New York. They still move to Chicago. They definitely move to Berlin. Um, um, Having that having that string to Auckland's bow, if we're just looking at it from an Auckland point of view, is a really useful thing. And, and if people know that there are lots of there's lots of support from the council, especially, and then um, initiatives like the City of Music um, scheme, that venues can operate, smaller venues can operate and do really really grassroots feed up kind of music culture um, uh, um, activities. Those things make um, cities very very attractive for young people to move to and um, um, and as soon as you have a flow of people moving it gets better and better and better like it has in Berlin or in, in New York in the 80s and 90s. And so uh, um, Mark you mentioned that um, music is a focus of um, some of the creative city kind of policy making for Auckland Unlimited in the coming year. 
have they um, has there been any work done to measure this like, like we talked about the size of London's nighttime economy are we, are we doing anything like that for yes here? and no yes so, and <laughs> yeah uh, so yeah the there is awareness that that work needs to be done how we do it is is complicated because the amount of data that we need to collect from different sources uh, you know it doesn't marry up so there is a lot of um, there's a lot of work to be done around that space and it, it is it's sitting there on everyone's desks to do. It's just, again, it's not going to happen overnight. So unfortunately, these things do take time to do, but they are they are there. So um, yeah, looking at um, comprehensive mapping of the city, of the city's eco music ecosystem, um, and trying to get that into a, a smart mapping system as well, so we can visualise it and see easily where where all the hotspots exist and, and so forth. Um, mapping year on year or probably what is more realistically going to be every every two years is, is you know, obviously a great way to, to benchmark ourselves and, and find out where the growth is needed and, and where we can get to. Yeah. And has there been, uh, this has probably not been considered yet, but I feel like it, it could be a good one, is will there be any consideration for that intersection of a daytime music tech scene with the impact around... A nighttime economy because I think obviously the value is say of um, actually think uh, I don't know oh Sam Griffin's there but we were um, <coughs> in the audience um, we were talking last night about the fact that probably between Serato and music and melodics there's been at least 300 jobs created in the K Road area which is actually really sizable right and that's actually you know we often celebrate companies that in the media that add 100 jobs and yet we don't often talk about yeah the value of that economic impact of this kind of cluster the size of what we've got around K Road and that has a in a, a interrelationship with the nighttime economy yeah, yeah. I think it's as a well. Whammy, and it's sort of what 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 um what Rob's talking about uh in, in some respects. So um the music tech sector and those those jobs are are, are creating a, an environment where we're attracting talent to the city. Um the music tourism for want of a better word, the the um the events, the the vibe is what keeps them here so they they work side by you know they work and they, they um work side by side and, and complement each other and um and what about our i'm not going to say nightmare i like i'm going to go night czar that's my i think that's a good name for it um the night czar is that something that auckland is considering or looking at or on the radar it's on the radar yeah yeah, um, and as is um, cultural districts as well. So that's that's another area of work that needs to be done. Yes. Yeah, so, so tell us a little bit more about the cultural district side. Uh, it's really just a. Um, I think in other cities you, you you can expect to go. This is this is where the music happens, or this is where the the vibrant scene is, as opposed to I guess the financial district or some other sort of district. Um, Rob and I have talked in the past about agent of change policies, um, and uh, is people aware of the agent of change policy at all? Okay, so uh, yeah, that I'll, would be a really good one. I've, I've no bits of it. I'd love to hear you give us the full perspective. I'll, I'll try to give you a, really a brief, brief yeah. run of it. But agent of change principle basically says that if you build, uh, if you build next to a venue, um, you are effectively the agent of change. So all the noise attenuation, all the problems get thrown on the property developer. Um, because you know, effectively, you know, this is to stop apartments getting built next to venues, and then everyone, all the residents, complaining about the noise coming from the venues, and the venue gets shut down. So, agent of change uh, has been deployed in quite a number of cities now around the world. In the UK, they've uh, they put it into the building code. So, it's just basically part of building a building. You have to make sure it's compliant to the agent of change principle. Um, However, my thought on it is in Auckland, it doesn't work so well because um, we, it, it, from my point of view, is that we need more venues. Um, it's going to inhibit the building of more venues or the opening of more venues because if you open a new venue, you're the agent of change. So it works both ways, right? Um, what you can do, however, is the um, Brisbane model, which is Fortitude Valley, if you've been in Brisbane and Fortitude Valley. Fortitude Valley basically works as their entertainment district. It's a noisy area. It basically says, you can live here um, and you can complain all you want, but we are not going to take any noise complaints seriously. This is where the music happens. This is the noisy area. Um, and that kind of uh, policy probably works better for um, Auckland situation. I mean, 
I, I could be wrong. <laughs> you know, this all has to be tested, um, but certainly looking at cultural districts um, and arts districts is, is definitely something that's on the radar. Um, just on the cultural districts thing, um, when I was involved with the local alcohol policy project in 2013, 14, 15, I pushed quite hard for the council to carve out Ponsonby Road and K Road so that they would be treated differently in licensing terms so that if, and, and this will happen in the future, um, that when um, the NIMBYs and the, the Karens or the whoever's of this world um, finally convince the government to close all bars at 1am because everyone after that is a Satan worshipping whatever, um, that there should still be a carve out that there'll be areas where venues that are music focused venues as opposed to say pubs um, will be able to apply on a merit basis for later licences and whether those later licences uh, go till 6 or 7am outright or whether they go till 4am and then after that you can't sell alcohol that was all discussed and they were quite enthusiastic um, the council was enthusiastic on the idea but it would require actually a law change um, you it couldn't come under the local alcohol policy um, so you know, lot, this stuff has been discussed, um, and I, I know that's just tying it to the alcohol thing. Um, but I, I wasn't tying it to the the availability of buying alcohol per se. But that if you had the had the venues that open the latest in a finite area, it would be easier to measure alcohol harm, be easier to prevent alcohol harm than what we currently have, which is people drinking in houses all over the city with alcohol they buy at the supermarkets for a fifth of the price of bars. So um, yeah, so the, the cultural sector carve out has definitely been discussed. Um, it's a very, it would require a lot of effort and a lot of lobbying, um, and you know, a ten year project. Yeah. And so Taylor with the, the Save Our Venues hat on, is that something that, you know, I'm saying we Save Our Venues as as a member, you know, is that something we're looking to kind of try and have a collective voice on? I feel like we could add something into that conversation, right? Specifically, K Road, or well, just that, the yeah, cultural sector, or the yeah, the cultural districts, and yeah. Well, I mean, I think like uh, anecdotally, K Road kind of is that the music venues are here, and we can see the effect that that, that is giving to everything else that's happening here. You've got uh, your tech companies coming in, you've got hospitality businesses starting here. Like venues in this area are giving life to the space and making it a safer, better place to be. I think. Uh, Queen Street for example is a big hot topic at the moment is a dead zone nothing's happening there I think culture sectors are cool but potentially there is room for music and music spaces to be to add something to other areas of Auckland there's no I mean, and I love the idea of it it all being in one space and kind of and getting leeway with council and stuff like that but we also need to get venues opening up at west and south and east and it it, it it shouldn't have to be localised like that because there are whole communities that don't have access to go a space to go and play or participate in the music community. So I think it's definitely a big part of proving something to council and to get what we need, but it also needs to be broader than, than a district, I think. I was just going to say, I'm interested to know, I, don't, I actually don't know this, but... Um we're very Auckland centric in this conversation, obviously because you know we, we have a, a skin in the game here. But w what's the rest of the country doing? Is Auckland kind of having to, f because we're the biggest city, we're figuring this out, or are there other cities that have kind of got some pretty interesting policies? That, I was, I, I had a meeting with uh, Dunedin, so they kind of have a, their own save a venues type thing down there that's been operating for quite a few years now because they have not many left and are getting really hit by um, noise control issues and um, they, they have put together a pretty substantial plan that's pitched to council that I'm hoping to get a look at um, and which will basically exempt them from existing venues from noise control issues. Um, the agent of change thing down there is really interesting because they don't have enough so they actually do need to build new ones and that's what you're talking about. The other way, the other way it goes, um, in Christchurch they're getting hit with kind of encroaching residential developments that's threatening ones down there. Um, I think Auckland is kind of localized. There's I don't know how many ten in in a couple of kilometres stretch here, 
um, around the country is a different setup. It's expensive, and and then we've got regional touring venues that need people from Auckland to travel around, and they need to be supported and considered part of the the circuit. And um, I think Auckland is absolutely the hub, but it needs to filter out into the rest of the country, really. Yeah. yeah. Um, everything we're talking about seems, uh, and this isn't uh, a criticism per se, because I know how hard it can be to change some of these environments, but yeah, it's quite incremental, right, what we're talking about here. And some of it is, you know, as you said, Mark, is potentially a long way away. But are there inter- any interesting, should we be thinking bigger or, or um, a little bit further afield? And the reason I'm asking that question is I, I haven't paid super close attention to it, but the UK, um, the Music Venues Trust in the UK, yep. Uh, I saw they recently said something about they're actually looking to actually purchase endangered, oh, well, endangered, you know, uh, music venues that are actually looking like they're going you know, yeah, to just crowdfunding it. Yep, yeah. yeah. Have you, and what's your thoughts on that? And that, you know, that's quite a radical move, obviously, but maybe we could talk about that a little bit. Keen to hear your thoughts. Yeah. yeah. Um, I sent it to, t- to Taylor. What did you think of it? <gasps> Steve's very excited about it, I think. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you got a plan? <laughs> yeah, good, good, good. Actually, maybe some crypto people could help us with the yeah. fundraising. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're NFT project. Yeah. Um, they uh, correct me if, if I'm wrong. It's you're you're kind of investing in. They're, they're doing a trial run of nine venues, I think, in the UK, where they are going to buy them as part of a within their charitable trust. But you uh, you're basically buying a share in in the venue. So you um, by supporting it, you are the you're becoming a part of the alliance that that owns them. To kind of, I think, on a peppercorn so like rent or yeah. So, so the venue becomes community owned yeah. effectively yeah. and takes it away from being owned by um, landlords. certain landlords who can <laughs> hold you hold you hostage. But is that is that the public will don't are they donating to the trust and then through that mechanism that's how the venues mm. are getting purchased? Is that yeah yeah. Like, yeah. So raising millions of pounds via yeah. via crowdfunding. Um, I think they were raising trying to raise is it two and a half million. Yeah, pounds, I mean, and they've got about ten percent there. I mean, it's only been running a few weeks because I saw that as one. Well. It was only like two and a half million. I was like, well, we get, we might get one venue out of that in Auckland. I don't know what the property prices are like there, but they're not dropping. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that's yeah, okay. So that's that's quite interesting actually. But um, so I guess continuing that theme just slightly, I guess is uh, in, I'd be keen to hear from the three of you. Like in an ideal world, say over the next two years, what are the things that you would really like to see? Taking into that <coughs> consideration all of that global context of some of these other music cities and what they're doing well, and some of these radical ideas that maybe have popped out in your blue sky thinking, where would you like to see Auckland being, and say, in the next two years as we come out of the pandemic? Um, and then, you know, that can kind of be extended right to be New Zealand generally, I guess. But with this view, right, that we should have this healthy, creative, vibrant, scene that is not just attractive to music tech actually because we talked a little bit about that obviously a lot over the last couple of days but even after the web 3 panel just before i had a quick chat to nicole one of the panelists afterwards and she was saying you know for them they're not you know a music business per se but they're a very creative business in terms of the different projects they're involved with on the web 3 side and she was saying you know uh, they've recently moved into k road this week from further downtown and k road's their natural location right she was like this is the perfect spot for us it's creative, it's vibrant, there's music venues, there's all this kind of stuff happening. So it's obviously an attractive element to the tech sector, not not just the music tech, but more broadly. So what do we want to do? How do we foster that? How do we make something that is pretty awesome in the city in the next two years? And what would you like to see if you could just wave your wand? Yeah. Oh, I'll start because I have an obvious one. Um, um, my one is um, I'd like the council to make their larger venues much easier for local music promoters to rent and use um currently venues like the the winter garden or the town hall are extremely expensive and it's hard for promoters to scale from that sort of three or four hundred person event up to the couple of thousand um and you know it's save for a couple of promoters who have got very very special privileged relationships with the council if you want to use a council venue they're the most expensive venues with the most expensive ticketing system with the 
lowest quality security, the slowest bar staff, and the and the smallest and the smallest selection of drinks. So you you basically can't do an event there unless you are doing something huge. And the council has these venues which don't get used for a lot of the year. And you know even even if they are, they should prioritise local music events. I think that would help tie in with um, growing you know, the sort of the mid-size events, the sort of up to two, 3,000 people events. Um, it would also sh- help them sort of um, capitalise on the Auckland City of Music stuff that they have committed to. Um, and I think it would be really good for promoters to be able to scale that way. Yeah, awesome. And so I guess, Taylor, over to you, because I think you obviously say about venues, but also your background with Whammy, right? So you, you've probably got... A few thoughts on this too. What's what's my dream? What's my dream? Uh, I think t- talk about council involvement and and the venues they have. I, th- I would like to see them invest in the ones that kind of they don't have that are already essential parts of the the scene and the community and the people that they have. And I think if you can take away some of that uh, the financial risk which on its on a very basic level, we can take that away then give venues the opportunity to invest in the people that are participating in them and support artists and be nurturing spaces for the people that are coming through it and the workers that are learning their trade there and going somewhere else. And all of the creative, I mean, people who do the sounds, people who do the posters, the people who make the music, there's, there's a huge creative export from just being in a, in a venue and they should be, council and government should be throwing money at them as, as a, very essential part of of the the economy and the creative economy, and I think um, yeah, if you take that risk out of it, then it gives venues a license to actually put in to the community that they're a part of, rather than just being a a room that they worried about paying the rent on. Awesome. And Mark, you're the city of music man. What's your well, dream? I'd like to see recognition and reward for music venues. Quite frankly, um, so and and things around um, there is certain states in America that do this, but uh, licensing rebates is, is one mechanism. So um, we have talked about rates rebates before, or I've certainly talked about rates rebate rate rebates at a council level, and that proves quite tricky to do. There's a lot of complications um, that I won't bore you with, but. Um, there is a way. Uh, there is mechanisms where you do licensing rebates. Um, you don't do the rebate per se. You do the the value of the rebate comes back to the venue, um, and that venue is getting that rebate or that payback because they are programming local music and are, are contributing to the music economy. Now, if that forces other venues to start thinking, should I better get on board and start programming more more local um, original music? That's fine. That's great. You know, that, that just generates more success. But um, coming back to the earlier point of like venues need to be recognised as community spaces, not as hospitality venues. Not everyone should be tarred with the same brush. It speaks to what uh, Rob's talking about with licensing as well. Um, if we're going to be seen as a city of music, if we're going to be seen globally, recognised as a, as a as a music city, we need to make it much easier to operate as a music city as for the music businesses to operate we need to create an environment where council make it far easier to be that music venue and to contribute to that that wider ecosystem because it will have knock-on effects for absolutely everyone and not just the music scene but the public at large yeah super interesting um i think there's a lot of ambition for us there and it'll be interesting to see how we can pull it all off together in the next few years but We've got a little bit of time before we are going to have to wrap this one, so I'd love to open it up to the audience for a bit of Q&A. I can see Isaac's, Isaac's been sitting there <laughs> excited the whole time, ready, ready to go. So. That was super interesting. Yeah, that was really interesting. Um, i got two questions. One is, Mark, you, you actually brought it back to it at the end, but the idea that venues should be, um, need to shift into being more of cultural community hubs. And I'd, you brought it up, but I'd like to hear each of your view on your personal view on what that actually means, what you view this new venue setting as a cultural community hub to be, and what, in your mind, the biggest challenge to making that happen is. And the second question is, I'd love to, this might be more specific for you, but where is the, a realistic assessment of where the discussion between music venues and AT and public transport um, is at the moment? 
Those are my two questions. Okay, so the first one, I guess what I mean by community hub, uh, uh, the venues are already community spaces, so, um, uh, and I don't think there's enough recognition of that, particularly, um, so uh, it, it's more about getting a mind shift going with council and interpreting how they see venues, because from a licensing perspective and from every perspective, it's just so much easier to go it's a hospitality venue. Boom! And you get you get hit with the same um, codes and laws and everything that everyone else does. Um, I'm asking for more um, delineation and, and and the fact that it's not black and white. It is lots of greys. Um, and as Taylor alluded to, we're not talking about hundreds and hundreds of venues here. We are talking about a small amount of venues. So this is not a hard thing for them to do. Um, but it's just that recognition as, as, as uh, you know, it's, oh, it's a music venue. Yes, yeah, it's a music venue, but it's also a place where communities come together um, and they're safe spaces uh, for the most part as well. Um, um, on the second point, um, AT. <sighs> where do we start with AT? Far out. Um, of all the council departments I've worked with, and I know this is getting recorded, so I'd be careful <laughs> what I would say. But of all the council departments I've worked with, and all the council departments that other council departments work with, AT is the hardest nut to crack. It's just, it's a law unto itself. Um, so, yeah, that's a conversation we continue to have. Um, there has been some work already done around audiences and, um, and how people are getting to and from venues and the, the economy of that and the safety aspects of that, um, but it's not nearly enough work has been done around that. Um, how to push those levers, we just, yeah, it's a work in progress. But it, but it is a work in progress, I will say that. It is something that, that everyone's hyper aware of and um, wants to see change happen. And, and I guess as motivated members of the public, right, we should be banging that drum right, if we want to see that change ourselves. I think it's a collective voice, isn't it? We'll, we'll help drive some of this. So, Yeah, I mean, geographically, we're, we're, Auckland's a, a tricky proposition, right? And, and we need to make it easier for people to get from outer suburbs into the city and, and back out again. Um, a, a, another example of something that did come up quite often in the local alcohol policy discussions, um, one of the drivers for the police to go for earlier licensing times was the night rider system was not working very well. So um, I, I chatted to the council at length and um, peripherally with AT and um, the, 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 the crux of it is so what? Um, you would need, you know, Auckland's such a big place with, you know, people of so far out, you know, sorry, larger bits of the audience do that the nighttime public transport system is, is a big challenge. And if you tie that into venues and you tie it into um, people getting home safely at night so they're not, um, they don't feel like they need to drive, then it helps knocking over some of the hurdles in the alcohol equation, which is inextricably linked to um, nightlife venues. Yeah, nice. Thank you. Um, okay, well, I think we've probably got time for one more question. I see two at the back. Uh, we might even squeeze them both. Uh, we'll start with Sam, maybe, and then, the and then Sam. Sam Harmony first, and then Sam. Kind of establishing their priority around women's and it's, it's great to hear. It's just, I think, especially like, I hate to bite the hand that feeds kind of thing, like the funding that may exist to be happened and maybe it's times when it happened, other people I know are doing, they all have to be free. And I pitched to the council when I applied for the funding, like, can we make it so it's not all 100% free? Like, it's great to have accessibility, but it's also great not to undermine people paying for the tickets to see a show. And I think there's these perverse incentives that happen sometimes with the council that it's like, I get it, it's far easier to get the funding signed off if it's free, but that sometimes generates these perverse incentives, and I just guess. Is there a high level thinking happening at council that actually involves the communities? Because it doesn't seem like there actually is. Yeah, and it's a really good point because um, I, I have the same problem as well with um, like with the reactivation fund, which was forcing being, um, promoters and event um, organisers to put everything on in the middle of winter, which was just insane. Um, and, and it clearly shows, you know, a lack of understanding or comprehension of of working in the sector, uh, um, working in the community, um, and that is effectively. 
why we set up City of Music in the first place was to, to be that interface to say, you know, if you've got questions about music, come and ask us. And even if we don't know, if even if I don't know the answer, I know who will know the answer to your question. Um, it's, yeah, it's just getting that across the line. So, with the, I mean, particularly with the reactivation fund, that was a, an odd one because that one came from central government um, and landed in Auckland Unlimited's lap and then they had to then farm it out. So um, normally I would say that that probably wouldn't happen and that conversation with City of Music would, would normally would steer them in the right direction. Um, but, yeah, you make a good point. And it's, um, I think if the community's got concerns, it should come to City of Music and we can take those concerns to Council and Council's got concerns goes the other way as well and that's what it's there for is to act as a connector for, for everyone to have that dialogue and, and get these things right you know Is there a regular, like, a uh, and in terms of, well, not like a, like a public forum or anything like that but um, it's reasonably easy to set, set meetings up and, and, and those conversations up if there was something you wanted to bring let me know Um, just come and talk to me. Yep. Uh, and what's the timeline on the generation of the report about nighttime, the nighttime economy? I think you've mentioned like, previously, like, you know, in cluster missions, you know, I think you've got to do the most integral part of what they do is generate information about the nighttime economy. You say there are not mechanisms to, to measure that when there are things like market view, which track real time consumer spending across the country. Yeah, it's just it's just with the with the music economy, there is a, there are a lot of different strands that have to be pulled together to make one report. So that's that's one aspect. There's the PwC reports that the music music industry organisations do as well. Um, there is various other um, data we want to pull on to make it one place. So it's just about uh, just trying to agree the terms with with council and Auckland Unlimited about how they want to gather that data and how they want to present it. So time frame, I can't give you a, a solid time frame at the moment. Um, it's just something we are working on um, and hopefully get it out ASAP because it's driving me nuts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we, we can squeeze in that last question from Sam. No, Sam's good. Okay. I think we're right on time, actually, uh, which is great. So I just want to um, say thanks to all of our panelists. So it was a really interesting conversation. I think you know, when you're crossing over with uh, local government policy and liquor licensing and trying to figure out, noise, you know, there's a lot of complex issues to navigate to kind of get this ecosystem humming. But I think it's obviously critical post-pandemic, and we've got this great opportunity to do it. So I just wanted to say thank you to to you all for sharing your views today and kind of engaging with every, everybody. Uh, so we'll give everyone a, a round of applause. Thanks. You guys.